Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us at this session, joint session on subtitling and captioning and IT solutions for supporting people who are deaf. <coughs> My name is Joanna Kinberger. I have the honor of presenting this session today. I work for Equalizent here in Vienna, but you can probably detect a British accent. Um, Equalizent is a training institute for deaf, hard of hearing, and hearing people, but I'm not going to say more about the organization because we have a presentation in the next um, session. So I'm doing a quick plug for Equalizent. So that one starts at 15.30. <coughs> Sorry, I apologize for the delay, but my running order is in the wrong order. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to present uh, Melissa Meitzkorn, who is from the Galladay University, Galladet University. She is a storyteller and digital strategist, creative director. She's fascinated by languages. She is, <coughs> has developed uh, bilingual storybook apps designed for early language acquisition of deaf children. But she will tell you more about this, and I give the floor to Melissa, thank you very much. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I am honored to be here among like-minded colleagues who are equally motivated to find good solutions. What we're doing here is defining the future. This work starts today. I'd also like to share that I am truly delighted that one of our programs, the VL2 Storybook Creator, was selected as one of the 10 innovative programs by the Zero Project for the Ashoka Impact Transfer Program. Yesterday, I had an opportunity to give a very short pitch, and today, thankfully, I have a little bit more time to talk to you about our Storybook Program. We created the Storybook Creator platform in order to promote something greater, which is addressing the issue of reading in deaf children. Deaf children, in general, are not reading or signing. But I'd like to emphasize that just because they aren't doing this doesn't mean that they can't. This is a major difference. The issue is not that they are unable. At Gallaudet University, we have a rich history of research and findings around the importance of children read children's reading. And what we know from the brain, as you can see on my slide here, is activation in, is activation in the language areas of the brain. One person's brain, one brain is from a deaf person, the other is from a hearing person. And what you see is that their brains are activated in the same exact space. For sign languages and spoken languages then, this means that the brain treats both languages equally. Both languages provide the same foundation that is needed for children to acquire language and eventual skills for educational success. We just learn through the visual modality, through our eyes. Signing is the most natural way for our brain to absorb a visual language in order to give us a foundation that then allows us to place building blocks for language. We know that when children are exposed to sign language, they hit the very same developmental linguistic milestones that their hearing counterparts hit at six months of age, 12 months, and 18 months of age, from babbling to having single word utterances to two word utterances. This is a normal developmental trajectory, and this is what happens with deaf children who learn sign language. Without that exposure to sign language, they miss those milestones. We see this time period as a critical period, and therefore this work that we're doing is urgent. Now, you may get a sense of that urgency, particularly because of what the brain is doing in these early years. 
to contextualize this a bit, 90% of deaf people are born to hearing families. So think about what that means for a new parent. A hearing person has a baby, they find out that that baby is deaf, and the parent realizes they don't know sign language, they don't know how to communicate. If they get a bit of support and learn how to sign, then they can put their child on a path with positive outcomes. But more often than not, parents don't get these resources, so their children don't get that early language exposure. And even being placed in school is no guarantee because only 3% of deaf children get a bilingual signed education, which then means that even smaller proportions of deaf people have the opportunity to become literate. So you can see the consequences of not having a strong foundation in a sign language. This means that you're depriving a child of language and virtually ensuring that they're going to face a lifetime of academic and employment difficulties. What we propose is a solution through a resource. What we've created is a platform that has the potential of transforming what our understanding of reading is and our understanding of documentation of sign language and how to partner with people globally. We have such resources. Our vision is to build a network of global teams working with families, working with deaf communities and deaf adults who might be struggling to gain employment, to work with them in order to build sign language resources for deaf children. Here we go. I just needed a little bit of help to get that video going. I want to be sure that you are able to see what these storybook apps look like. This video gives you a sense of what the experience is like of using the app so you can get a better sense of what I'm describing here. This is a compilation of snippets from different storybook apps, so you'll see different storytellers. Everything that you see here, from the artwork to the videography, was done by deaf people. We assembled teams of storytellers, illustrators, and then we also provided training. And the training that we offered provides a digital skill set that will benefit people for the rest of their lives. That means that it enhances job opportunities. And in order to build this content that goes into the storybook apps, you just plug it into the platform. The platform is content flexible. We support a variety of languages. As you can see in the video here, the platform integrates text and video. If a child doesn't understand one of the words in the text component, they can click on the word and then see an inset video with the word being signed, spelled, and then signed. We've been working on this platform since 2012. The program has been expanded to seven other countries, but think about what that means for the families and deaf education. What sorts of sign language resources already exist? For the most part, they don't. So we've built partnerships and trained deaf talent. We've worked peop with people in other countries to build local teams and then we've also asked them to consider what cultural stories they have that deaf children might be missing out on if some of those cultural stories and cultural folk tales are only shared through an oral tradition. This offers a way to document people's respective cultural stories. The point I'd like to make is that while I know that the UN has four sustainable development goals that focus on quality education, I emphasize that the point is quality access to education, but what does quality mean, especially when we're talking about language access? And language access for deaf children means access to sign language. Having a foundation in a sign language enhances a child's ability to learn to read and write. 
This is what can ensure that they will be a full participating member of society. That is what access means. I'd also like to show you what our eventual goal is. Our goal is to create a global digital library. Sign language is not universal. It's not the same in all countries, which is why I need to re-emphasize the importance of this platform being content flexible. It can support a variety of languages. What you see here is the same story being told in six different signed languages. The storybooks are also presented in a written in different texts, depending on whatever the written language is of that country. So there's a version in Norwegian Sign Language, in Russian Sign Language, along with the story in their Cyrillic alphabet. We have it told in Saudi Arabian Sign Language, and the text is Arabic. So the introduction of Arabic means that we support text from right to left. The platform is able to support different types <clears throat> of alphabets and reading directions. So start to think about what is possible for reading. I'd also like to give you a sense of the ecosystem that this program can enable. From training deaf adults in skills like filmmaking and editing, and then developing these storybook apps, that are also content flexible. This means you can put in content about different subject areas and have community and family involvement. We've already done a usability assessment and studies on vocabulary development. What we have found is that children are so immediately engaged with the storybooks. What you see right now is a video of a group of deaf children huddled around a tablet engaged with the storybook just naturally, without any prompting. This shows the hunger that children have and their desire to learn. According to our assessments, what we have found is that they do gain in their vocabulary scores after using the apps because they have access to the concepts behind those vocabulary words in sign language and in text. So now you might be wonder, wondering about other media that's already available and that subtitles or captions means that things are accessible. But what we're talking about is children from the ages of birth to five or as late as eight. This population at this age are considered emergent readers. They aren't proficient readers yet, so they can't rely on captions. Therefore, captions are not accessible. They have to learn to read first. Okay, so for this program then to scale, we need to find a local implementer and funding partnership for training and to increase capacity, which can lead to the impacts that I just described to you, to improve deaf children's reading abilities, family experiences. Teachers can also use this to support a bilingual classroom. So the storybook apps have the ability to support many aspects of our community. This is what we're looking at as part of Gallaudet's mission and part of our reason for being, to create connections with the community globally. Thank you very much. And if you would like further information, please visit our website. And also, please feel free to come to my booth. I do have a tablet with several storybook apps downloaded onto it, so I'm happy to show you the apps and let you engage with them throughout the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa. That was absolutely fascinating. The applications for other languages can certainly be very useful in the future. <clears throat> the second speaker is uh, Yaifa Margarita Meza Arango. I apologize, my Spanish is rubbish. Um, <laughs> from the Ministry of Information and Communication Technologies in Colombia. She's head of the international office at the Ministry of Information and communication technologies, and she's worked for seven years in international cooperation and global affairs in different public and private entities. Hi, uh, I wanted to thank you, Zero Project, for having us here uh, today. Um, actually, Colombia has 
two uh, projects that we'll be showing today how we are working with uh, disabilities, with people with disabilities. Um, since in our country, this is actually a, a huge or a very important issue that we have as a state policy, we have incorporated in our public policies, and uh, we are with this trying to comply with what it is uh, stated in the UN Convention for People with Disabilities. Um, Cine para Todos, or Movies for Everyone, which would be the English translation of the activity that I will be explaining, has, has a mode um, how do I? Oh. Has um, has a core. Uh, the it's a space where people with cognitive, auditive, and visual uh, disability can access to movies, to certain movies that have audio technology for uh, for a description, um, have interpretation in sign language, and have special subtitles so that people with co with cognitive problems can uh, read the movie uh, and the description of the movie while it's being displayed. Uh, four of the most innovative things that are shown by Cine Para Todos are, the first thing is that uh, 12 movie theaters <coughs> throughout the entire territory show these kinds of movies and uh, creating access environment so that uh, people with disabilities can come with their families and uh, with their boyfriends and in their regular basis to attend the movie that is being displayed. These, um, these movies are only played in these 12 cities once a month. Nonetheless, the other innovative part of this project is the fact that uh, throughout the other part of the country, in 34, uh, sites that we call Punto Vive Digital, we can also <coughs> show the movies once they have been uh, shown in theaters so that other people and other people with disabilities can also access to them even if they do not have access to the 12, uh, to the 12 cinemas where they, we are uh, showing the, the movies. Uh, another uh, innovative issue uh, regarding Cine Para Todos is the fact that uh, nowadays we use the descriptions, the audio descriptions that uh, result from the Cine Para Todos has, a, uh, has, a, ver has a, a, a modern version of radionovelas. And in places where we do not have access uh, with movie theaters or with puntos, video digital, people can hear the description of the contents that we have already uh, translated into sign, into sign or into a hearing uh, language. Um, la since 2016, we have also been developing workshops so that people with, uh, that are working in, movie th that in the movie business can, be, uh, can acknowledge the opportunity of uh, creating <coughs> movies for people with, um, with disabilities and use the, te the, the techniques that we are providing has an inspiration for their movies that they are creating. We create these through workshops that we, uh, that we make or display throughout the entire territory. This is part of a whole um, program created by the government in order to create access to ICT uh, for everyone in, in Colombia. With Cine Para Todos, particularly, <coughs> we have benefited more than 80,000 people. We have already displayed 600 free functions in 12, seat, in 12 cities, and we have, create, we have translated uh, 79 uh, accessible films. This is part <coughs> of a policy that aims at um, attending over two million people with, uh, with, dis uh, with disabilities. And it's also part of a, a strategy, uh, of the same policy that the government has for people with disabilities. Uh, in the future, we want to have a, uh, an application so that everyone can access to the movie theaters without no matter where they are or what city they are. It doesn't matter if they are in the 12, first, in the 12 main cities that I already mentioned. 
uh, because we want to create opportunities so that people with these disabilities can access to, can be part of the day-to-day -day life. Also, um, we are creating a sustainability study which will aim at recommending what other activities can develop <coughs> the government in order to bring these uh, people with disabilities into normal life uh, by using the already activities that we are developing in order to create access or another or new innovative activities that will help us bring together the entire this, uh, population with disabilities in their different kinds of disabilities. One of the main uh, challenges that we are facing nowadays is the fact that this requires a lot of um, a financial structure that we still don't have, but uh, the important is that the government has already uh, acknowledged the rights of these people with disabilities and that is deploying a huge effort to attend their disabilities in their different areas. We want to have in the future even more functions on behalf of Cine Para Todos. We want to be able to provide uh, presentations in more, uh, in, in other places where the ministry is, uh, is getting with information and communication technologies. And we want to bring every activity from the ministry uh, that uses ICT into people with disabilities in order to be able to make the most of the usage of ICT for people with these conditions. Thank you very much. Sorry, you stopped very suddenly. <laughs> Thank you for this fascinating insight into uh, accessible cinema in Colombia. Um, we're going on to our third presenter now. Um, Henry Mejia Royet Fenascor is director of the National Federation of the Deaf in Colombia, so we're staying in South America. He has extensive experience in administration, public policy and disability, and coaching groups in areas such as leadership, human rights, and construction of public policy in disability. I'm looking forward to his presentation, and I give him the word. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad to be here. And thanks to the Zero Project to invite us in order to present the Centro de Relevo project. We are very proud of it. Centro de Relevo, Centro de Relevo is some um, uh, relay services for the deaf people. And whole, in the whole world, there are relay services uh, in a few countries. And in South America, there are two countries who have uh, relay services, like Colombia and Paraguay. But uh, the great problem for the deaf people is to, is to communicate. How can Colombia has uh, developed the Central Relevo project? This is a result of the public-private uh, partnership between the Ministry of ICTs and the National Federation of the Deaf of Colombia. This is a very rare project because Colombian government has entrusted, managed, and the operation to the National Federation of the Deaf. So that means the deaf people are managing the, the, the project. We have gained the trust and uh, the proud of the deaf community. In most of countries, the relay services are managed for hearing people, and uh, deaf people do not have that mm, uh, proud or that trust in their projects. This is a good practice between the government and the civil uh, society. And we are very proud of it, very proud of it. By now, the National Federation of the Deaf has 36 
deaf association from all over the nation. With all of them, we have been doing the political advocacy in order to the government to establish a national public disability policy and to establish the Centro de Relevo within it. In order to have the uh, Centro de Relevo for very many years. By August of this year, there will be a change of the government, but it doesn't mean that it will be over for the Centro de Relevo. We have our uh, public policy for disability. And with this public policy, the government has found in Colombia all around of uh, 700 interpreters. Colombian government is founding their services. But it doesn't mean the need is covered. The lack of interpreters, it's great. We need uh, nearly 2,000 interpreters. It's not enough with the 700 interpreters. And uh, we saw the uh, situation of the other countries all around South America, and the government is the governments are uh, not founding the interpreters all around the, the South America. Deaf people said, "You need to pay the service." But government said, we don't have money. So uh, the lack of interpreters in Colombia has leading us to make the uh, telework model in which every sign language interpreter is working from their home all around the nation. So it allows the deaf people to use our services. Last year, our interpreters has uh, relayed relay 456,500 calls, which uh, cannot be doing without a relay services. Deaf people, before the relay service, the Centro de Relevo, deaf people need to uh, call of uh, their relatives or their friends in order to do a, uh, a call. But it doesn't mean a good communication. By now, with Centro de Relevo, deaf people can communicate free with another hearing person. And we do have the CL which is the video remote interpretation in uh, medical, laboral, banking, transactions context. The last year, deaf people use the VRI service, CL, in 20,000 services. And in, at this moment, I can show you how it works. We have an app an application which is, can be downloaded to your mobile and used worldwide. If I am in South America, I can use uh, the interpreter right there because it is in Spanish. But our interpreters do not use English, so I cannot use uh, uh, the app right now. Because in our country, in, we do not have so many interpreters who uh, manage the Colombian sign language and also English and also Spanish. In the future, we hope that the, that number of uh, interpreters now in English uh, grow and to use only the app. 20,000 of interpretation services in medical, laboral, education, uh, legal context it's a very wide number. And uh, deaf people do not need to pay for that services. It's completely free because the government is funding it. Our experience, and we are uh, looking at that services, 
and is uh, the service in the context of family. When a family has a deaf relative and do not sign language, they used to isolate uh, their um, deaf relative. But now, with the CL service, the video remote interpretation, they can communicate easily. The parents can communicate with their children, and uh, they, um, it's a great for the families because before, yes, before the Centro de Relevo, families have a lot of problems for uh, communicate with their relatives, deaf relatives. In the, the Centro de Relevo project has replicated in Paraguay also too. We do a, um, adv our advice to Paraguay. Last, uh, last year, we were celebrating our 15th anniversary, and the Ministry of ICTs has emitted a philatelic emission, which is in 192 museums all over the world. We expect for more funding from private and public sectors in order to replicate this Centro de Relevo. We are very proud of it, and thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Henry. Fascinating. Before we go over to questions, I'd like to introduce our fourth uh, presenter um, from Israel. Gala Prompter was launched two years ago, and the lady sitting next to me is the CEO of Gala Prompter, Jonat Berlin. The company's mission is to make the performing arts accessible to everyone. Throughout her career, she's worked with innovative companies using her leadership roles to ensure accessibility for everyone. Over to you, Jonat. Hi, everyone. Um, so, how does it click? I think it's the big green button. This one. Yeah. There we go. So Gallapro app has been created to provide accessibility and translation services for live shows, theater, opera, concerts, music events. It's made to make everything accessible to everyone. Um, the app was created based on the idea that entertainment and culture are the core of our communities, and this is really what brings everyone together. So our mission is to make shows accessible every single performance anywhere in the world. We're a startup company. We opened three years ago, and we now have a team of 10 people in Israel and in the US. I know it says eight, but I did this a while ago. Um, there we are. Um, so our app provides closed captions, multilingual subtitles, amplification, audio description, and dubbing directly to the user's own mobile device with no disturbance to the show. Our app is free, and it can be downloaded from the app stores and used in any theater that is in our database. It is designed to adhere the strict rules of theater so it doesn't disturb the show. During the show, the user's phone is on airplane mode and connected to a closed Wi-Fi network. You can see in the picture right here that these are what the subtitles or captions look like. So they're red and a dark background to make sure there's no backlight on the phone and there's no disturbance. We also offer gray for subtitles as well. For audio services, all you need to do is plug in your headset. Um, our system is built around our patented voice recognition algorithm, which ensures that the show content is in sync. The most important thing for our users is that they're able to cry, laugh, and enjoy the show exactly when everyone else in the audience does, not a few seconds before and not a few seconds after. With our voice recognition technology, we assure that the content is provided real time and in sync with the actual show on stage. The most important thing to understand about our technology is that providing these automated services, the venues can now be accessible every single performance. We're not here to replace sign language interpreters or open caption shows. We're here to make sure that every performance is accessible. Not just one performance in a quarter, not just once every production, every single performance. So people have a real choice. They can attend when they want with their families and friends and sit wherever they want to sit. 
Shows working with us actually provide closed captions and audio description as well as the language services every single performance. Using our automated technology, they don't have to pay someone to be there every single performance. It's all done automatically. Our solution is scalable. So no matter how many people walk in the door and would like to use the services, there's no equipment limitations or nothing the venue has to maintain, purchase, support, or service as soon as our system is installed. Impact. Our main impact on accessibility for live shows is that we're changing the standards of the entertainment industry. Having one accessible show once in a while is no longer enough and not, accept and not acceptable. Together with the Broadway League in New York, which aggregates all of the on and off Broadway theaters, we have set a new standard in what truly means to be accessible and what it means to provide these services every single performance. The Broadway League, with all of its 60 on and off Broadway theaters in New York, is committed that all theaters will be providing closed captioning and audio description every single performance by June 2018. We are also working with the Schubert Theater Group in New York to create a library of captioned scripts. So when a production decides, decides to use a script that already exists, it comes with the captions and they don't have to pay to create them all over again. Now that this becomes a Broadway standard, more and more smaller theaters outside New York and across the US have been approaching us. And our current mission is to be able to work with as many small community and nonprofit theaters as possible. We're working with municipalities such as New York's Mayor's Office for Media and Entertainment and other funding um, organizations to make sure that our technology can be offered to as many small theaters as possible. Um, so some of our achievements are one, speaking here after lunch where everyone is tired, and two, um, our product is now live working and being used by patrons on Broadway. Um, we have set new technology and accessibility standards there, and we see its effect on the rest of the country. Our voice recognition is working very well, and we've had to come, overcome great barriers in creating and designing the system. Our voice recognition technology works now with musicals, plays, can deal with Shakespeare, weird funny accents, and everything needed to really sync with any kind of performance. The big change is, is that it's not about phones in the theater anymore. When I went knocking on doors a few years ago in the big Broadway shows and telling them we're going to be using cell phones to make everything accessible, they told me there's not a chance. So now they all have phones in their theaters making them accessible and it's all about accessibility and not about phones anymore. We have managed to raise $3 million from private funding um, from investors who believe that our mission is not only important but sustainable and scalable. And our biggest achievement is receiving an innovation award tonight from the Zero Conference. Um, we have many challenges as far as sustainability and growth. Being a startup in the accessibility world, as everyone knows, is, is not easy. Um, and also convincing venues that accessibility isn't just about regulations, it's an opportunity for them to grow and bring a wider audience into their, into their venues. And that ac accessibility actually means selling more tickets and that they can have more people there. Captions, as you know, aren't only for people who are hearing impaired. A lot of the people who end up using our services are not specifically hearing impaired. They just want to be able to follow the show and enjoy what's going on. So a venue using our equipment is not only accessible to a specific part of community, but really to everyone. Um, our biggest achievement has been really in shows when people didn't think they would need it, but they saw other people using it and they decided to start using it in the middle of the show and make their show more enjoyable. Still with these challenges, we're very optimistic and we hope to be in over 100 theaters in the US by the end of 2018. Last one. So as far as markets, we are working now in theater. Um, but we believe we have a market um, in cinema and in lectures and in live tourist attractions. And as soon as we do reach 100 theaters in the US, we plan to work in those markets as well. So to summarize, we are hoping that, the technology is, uh, that now that the technology is available, it'll change the accessibility standards for the whole industry. And no one will no longer to be able to afford to not be fully accessible every single performance. And that everyone will be welcomed into the venues in whatever language they speak and whatever services they require. Thank you. Jonat, thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. So
So, I know it's after lunch, but I'm sure there are some questions. <laughs> so would anybody like to ask our first four speakers any questions? Don't be shy, raise your hands. There are no questions, ladies and gentlemen. Can you believe this? Good, good thing we left time for that. At the back, the lady in red. Thank you very much. I've got two questions. One is um, for the lady who was talking about storytelling. Um, is there any push to include sign language with hearing children as well so that they learn faster? Because my understanding is that uh, children, all children sign. They just don't necessarily have the opportunity. So I was just wondering whether you've done any studies on, on that. And the other is um, the lady who's just spoken about the um, closed captioning in plays and theatres. Is, is this working here? Is this how we're having um, subtitles while you talk? What, what's the access to all sorts of um, verbal presentations? Is it, is it, can you use the app in that way so that you could just take it into a store or on a transport system and be able to understand what people are saying um, if, you, if, you, if they're not making any sense to you? Was that, you, you asked, wanted to ask two questions or three? Or was that three questions? That was two. That was two. Sorry, I think that was two, but I might have asked more. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Anybody else? Joanna, I'm happy to respond to that. Should I respond now? Uh, yes, please, Melissa, thank you very much. Thank you for your question. I certainly also think that it's a very important question. So you've at, you mentioned that all children can sign and you asked whether hearing children could learn how to sign through the storybook apps. So to answer, you sort of embedded two questions in one, so to respond to the first point, yes, all children can sign as long as they have exposure to the language and access to a signing community, then all children could learn sign language. Now, as to whether or not hearing children could use the storybook apps, the answer is absolutely. What's actually interesting is that at the Visual Language and Visual Learning Center at Gallaudet University, we've actually found that the cognitive benefit and cognitive advantages of bilingualism are still true for those who sign and speak. So you can have one language in the visual signed modality and the other in a visual written modality. And just having those two different languages provides you cognitive benefits, which then enables you to learn other languages more quickly. And you're also more able to handle code switching. This is, there's an interesting new finding about bilingual advantages. And the basic answer is that Really, we need to make the most of all human cognitive capacity, and to do that, you should learn a sign language, because that really contributes to the human experience to capitalize on our ability to use a visual language. The point I'd like to drive home here is that the whole language access system is there, but children aren't getting access to it, especially not deaf children and that's what we want to change. This is where we're looking for partnerships and an understanding on the part of people who don't sign. We're asking that people understand just why this is so critical. Thank you so much for your comment and your question. I'd be happy to chat with you more later. Thank you. Um, so to answer the second part of your question, Right now, the technology is designed specifically for live shows, meaning pre-scripted shows. The next stage is um, open speech and speech that's not pre-scripted, which should be ready in the beginning of next year. Um, so we're not currently supporting here. We do do conferences um, uh, when, when some of the content is pre-scripted, but right now we're specializing in shows and entertainment.
And I think that there was a second part to the question. Is this possible to, be, to use it in stores and on public transport? So within a year, when, when our, um, that stage of development is complete, then we will be able to use it in other areas. Right now, it's specifically meant for uh, entertainment. Thank you so much. Are there any more questions before we go to the next round of presentations? Everybody's, everybody's really shy and just eating their lunch, haven't they? Okay, I think we'll go to the next round of presentations, if we may. Next speaker has flown over here from the United States. Stephen King is joining us from the State Department. He has led three of the largest federal disability initiatives in the US and is currently director of the Office of Accessibility and Accommodations. If I may hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. As stated, my name is Stephen M. King. Sorry to disappoint, I'm not the author. That's why I put the M in the middle. Um, and also, I'm not as dynamic as the previous speaker, so I apologize in advance. But as I am the director of the Office of Accessibility and Accommodations in the Bureau of Human Resources at the U.S. State Department. On behalf of my team, the Bureau of Human Resources and the Department of State, I want to thank the ISO Foundation and Project Zero for recognizing our innovative practice and advancing a world without barriers. The creation of my office was authorized in 2015. With its creation, we became the first federal cabinet level agency in the U.S. to centralize all aspects of our internal disability programs and the first to place it under the direct leadership of a member of the Senior Executive Service, a small cadre of senior leaders across the federal government. The establishment of my office, the creation of the executive position I now hold, and the program I'm here to speak to you about today, our video captioning program, underscores the Department of State's commitment to being a model employer of individuals with disabilities. The U.S. Department of State leads America's foreign policy through diplomacy, advocacy, and assistance. Our mission cannot be limited by borders or languages. To complete our mission, we provide ample professional development opportunities, training to over 100,000 federal employees each year. The training, of course, must be accessible. We have an internal broadcast network, BNET, that delivers content to all of our embassies and consulates around the world. The individuals who co comprise our workforce tend to know multiple languages, and English isn't necessarily the primary or first language. So, our message must transcend these barriers to be effective. A message without barriers, information sharing without barriers. My office has created an innovative approach through which we offer equal access to our video and multimedia content. The video content we caption is diverse. Some of it is unclassified, some of it is labeled as sensitive, other material is non-sensitive. The system we developed allows us to easily track and process requests. We can seamlessly communicate with vendors, our staff, and other diverse clients. We can track captioning costs, metrics, and trends. Although there's a snapshot in the right-hand side of the screen of our system, I'll go into more detail about that momentarily. Our video captioning program is a component of our Section 508 program. I know most, some of you probably know what 508 is, but 508 refers to Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Um, while most are likely more familiar with the ADA, Americans with Dis Disabilities Act, which dates back to 1990, again, the Rehabilitation Act, which applies to federal government agencies, has been around for 17 years longer. While the ADA applies to private industry, or, I'm sorry, private entities and state and local governments, the federal government must comply with the Rehab Act. The 508 standards were added in 1998 as an amendment. 
Our video captioning program, however, was not officially established until 2013, 2014. That's when we had a soft launch, if you will. Um, it became more formalized in 2015. So quite some time after the legal requirement, yes. It's not that we did not caption videos prior to them. It's just we did not develop such a refined system until more recently. Since its inception in 2015, we've captioned over 10,000 video products. That may not sound like a lot, uh, but some of the offices throughout the Department of State, some of our embassies, some of our consulates, have actually chosen to continue to pay to uh, caption their own media content. So not everyone relies on our program. I'll show you a slide of our, um, I guess, what our customer sees if they want to use our service. And again, our customers are internal Department of State personnel. Um, it's a SharePoint site. A lot of people don't necessarily see it as being SharePoint. It just seems like a regular website, but it is very user friendly. I think one of the great things about the website and about the program is that it was actually designed by someone who has zero background and knowledge of video captioning, the deaf community, our website design. She was given the project and she just created something that she thought would be user friendly and it works. So if you want a video transcribed, there's a button for you to press. If you need a video caption, there's a button. Uh, if you want your video live captioned, you can select that option. You, there's a button to contact us. Uh, if you want information, more uh, information, or if you just don't even know what video captioning is, which quite frankly, many of our customers did not realize, the legal obligation or what video captioning really was prior to this program being created. Again, we use SharePoint uh, to create this. And not only does it have, can you um, submit your request through the previous screen that I showed you, we have links to our policies, our standard operating procedures. We have frequently asked questions which are generated from feedback that we receive from our customers. Of all the initiatives in my portfolio of programs, by far the program that receives the most positive customer feedback is this one. Uh, people find it very easy. Our customer service is outstanding. And, and I'll probably touch on this again later, I love the fact that in some cases we are able to turn around a caption product. These would be recorded um, recorded programs that people come to us and ask us to caption within 24 hours. And I think that's pretty remarkable. We're able to do that in part because we have personnel located around the world. So when I leave at 5 p.m. in Washington, D.C., that doesn't mean that I have to wait until 8 a.m. the next morning for someone to begin working on captioning that video. And I think that's pretty remarkable. I had mentioned uh, about the feedback. There's actually a, a pop-up here, or a screen, an image, that actually uh, mimics the feedback form that we request from all of our clients. And like I said, it's been rather um, beneficial, and we have a huge response rate, which I think is pretty remarkable. Some of our success factors, and I'm not going to really talk much about, I, I, I didn't create the slides myself. I'll learn next time to do it on my own. I'll summarize it in another way. I think the keys to our success is one, senior leadership support. The senior leader took this to heart, wanted to do it better, to do captioning better, to make it more robust, to make sure that we deliver caption products all around the world in all languages. The centralization of captioning support and services into one office. Using SharePoint, something a lot of people are familiar with, Delivering our products via the cloud, again, making it accessible to many people th around the world. Elimination of cost to individual offices. My office covers all the costs for captioning products within the State Department. That's unusual in the federal government. A lot of times that cost goes to the individual offices. So what happens? 
Some of the offices just don't caption their content even though it's required by law. So we've overcome that barrier. Um, our use of a diverse mix of employees located around the world, we have the ability to caption in over 70 languages and have delivered captioned products to over 200 seas, uh, overseas locations. I also think it's quite remarkable that we utilize unpaid interns at times. So imagine being 19 years old, you want a job with the federal government, your family is possibly working for the Department of Defense, your father's in the military located in Germany, whatever it may be, then you have an opportunity through our unpaid internship program to work with us, to caption videos for us, to get federal government experience. And yes, it's voluntary, but we've had no problem finding volunteers to help us with this. And again, I think that's a way to save taxpayer dollars and something that a lot of other entities could look at doing. Also, it, it, it goes without saying, I have a very dedicated team of professionals uh, that's certainly a key to our success and that they provide excellent customer service. I've mentioned turnaround times, how quickly we can uh, provide products. The standard is three to nine days for, not for live captioning, of course, that would be immediate, but for things that people come to us and they want captioning, we generally offer a three to nine day time frame. We can meet that in easily over 70, 75% of the time, even in peak season. Same day requests of eight hours, 90% success rate. One day, 24 hour period, regardless of language, uh, we were able to do that in over 70% of the time. Prior to receiving uh, this honor and being here today, I will mention that the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the enforcement agency in the United States when it comes to anti-discrimination laws, et cetera, in 2016, they compiled a list of the uh, most successful disability initiatives under the Obama administration, and our video captioning program was one of the programs uh, recognized through that effort. And with that, I'll wrap it up. Uh, thank you very much for having us here today. We're very proud of uh, this award, and I am honored to be on stage with so many dedicated, talented professionals from throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you very much to you. We're honored to have you here. So I'd like to move on to our next speaker. Uh, Lorenzo Di Giaccio. He worked for four years as an IT consultant until he decided to quit and found Pedios, which he's going to tell you all about and share with you. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here and sharing my, my story. As, um, as described before, I left my job as an IT consultant because I, I watched an interview of a guy named Gabriele. He had a car accident in Rome, and he wasn't able to call a tow truck or an ambulance because he's deaf, and the relay service was closed because he's out of working hour. In that day, I never met a deaf person. I was shocked that there is no way for a deaf person to make a phone call, despite all the technology that we have in this world. So one week later, I decided to quit my job and dedicate myself to find a solution. We decided to do that uh, not as a, a foundation or as a non-profit or an NGO. We, um, I had the chance to meet uh, some social entrepreneurs, so to get close to the, the world of social uh, entrepreneurship. So I decided to start with the business logic. So not only the tow, tow track, there are a lot of services that are not accessible, they are only accessible by phone. So still a digital barrier. In a world that is becoming more and more digital, we have to need to think a new barrier to overcome. So an example is the, the touch screen is became a great uh, obstacle for blind people. And as we designed ramps for the step, what we can imagine for all the digital barriers that we are going to create with developing new technology. So this is a new way to think about technology. And what is what it done? Thinking about uh, like an enterprise means that we need to consider number. The first time I talk to investor about the number, I say, okay, deaf people are only a niche. 
you cannot um, start a business with so small number. But we say, okay, even if in Italy we have only 70,000, look around the world, there are 70 million. So the numbers are changing. And one thing that most of them using a smartphone, because a normal phone is very useless if you are deaf. So our solution is basically very simple. We transform a chat in a phone call using text-to-speech and voice recognition technology. So I type a message, there is a voice reading that message on the recipient, and every sentence pronounced is converted into text, so the deaf person can read it. They can use the contact list, so call their friends, but most of them, they don't need to call the friends because they can send a text to them. What happens if you need to call uh, like an ambulance or if you lost your credit card? The only way to block it is making a phone call. So we have a list of services uh, that are, will be accessible with our technology. The app is, uh, I will tell later about the price because there is also a story behind it means one part of the social enterprise. So this is just an example of the story of Gabriele, what can be done. But I will not go too deep in, too deep in the technology because I'm here let's, uh, sharing this, uh, my enthusiasm in finding a solution and think how to be sustainable. So one of the problems is that companies see uh, accessibility as something mandatory. I already told that uh, I don't be put captioning because it's mandatory. Think about what you can be done, the power. We talk about the value of the diversity, and the value of diversity must be shared. So we talk about communication. So what we want to do is have no impact on infrastructure. We were able to enable the biggest call center in Italy receiving 100,000 phone calls every day in just 24 hours. So we are like a virtual relay service using technology to do that. So we think also about uh, work inclusion, because we have deaf employees that are always cut off from the um, meeting and calls, uh, some, especially when they are suddenly, oh, let's, let's call a meeting, and you have no time to let an interpreter come to, to you. And also, if you need to talk with the other people or, or having some like, uh, high level of um, formation, you cannot rely all the time on an interpreter, especially in countries where it is always represented as a cost. So the idea, of course, we don't want to replace the interpreter, but we want to keep the interpreter for the serious thing like uh, conference and, and uh, lectures. But if I had a flat tire, there is no need for an interpreter to call a tow truck. So of course, there's a lot of law about discrimination, but we don't think about um, this is not a value proposition for accessibility service. There is a lot of law enforcing, but there are a lot of laws that are not respected. There is no fine for not having uh, captioning services, at least in Italy, in most of the European countries. It's just a good way, it's nice to have, but it's not mandatory. I think the uh, speed limit is a law, but I think most of them don't respect strictly speed limit, because they don't believe. I have a different perception of speed, so I go a little bit higher. So this is most common sense. And what we want to do, that this common sense must be this part. So deaf people must be included in every communication. And this is a way to, to apply common sense is entrepreneurship. And this is our mission. I think this is a mission also, oh, my colleague is entrepreneur in his adventure. So last thing is today, we were able to raise money from private investors, almost 2 million euros. And with these 2 million euros, enable us to reach 70,000 users in 10 countries. So we today had an interesting meeting, and probably we will open uh, in Austria Germany. Germany is in yellow in the map. That means that we are planning to open. Now we'll add Austria, thanks to the connection that this event is already done. So we decided to go in China, because China is the, <laughs> is the biggest um, country where most of the deaf people live. One third of the deaf population in the world live in China. Probably because pollution gives more chance to have a, a brain and acoustic nerve damage. But probably China is not the richest place. And this is one approach. Our mission is having more deaf people making phone calls. That's the re reason why we decided to go to China, even all the te um, technological barriers and also cultural barriers. We rely on companies. And that is why uh, we grow up in this way, in this direction. So 90% of our revenues came from companies that are paying to be accessible. And be accessible is a way to promoting, is an, is the new, will be the new marketing. 
So I not be accessible because I will have a deaf customer. One reply that I got for uh, one of the call center is, I never receive a phone call for a deaf person, so I don't need that. So it's, it's not, no sense. <laughs> so what, what we are doing, the other part of the, the incomes came from the users. And this is our approach. So we offer three, min three minutes, uh, 20 minutes free every month. And the rest is um, with a small fee of 30 euro. This is because not, we don't treat deaf people as a disabled. We won't treat them as a customer. So this is the difference between uh, uh, assistentialism. So the government must be pay everything for the disabled and leave the disabled like uh, uh, only can, can do something with their help. They are not independent. We won't give the chance to be uh, independent. They complain. We receive a lot of complaints from our users, but it's normal. We provide a service. So our mission is that we be not like service for uh, uh, free service for people with disability. This is a kind of discrimination. The idea is that all the service must be accessible for all and designed for all. And this is our approach. One of the beautiful things I, I, regarding the storytelling and the babies uh, the, the, for the children, we, dis we discovered with our experience with the people that there is a huge problem in literacy level since our technology works with uh, text-to-speech, there is a, a minimum requirement. So we try to help writing a, a proper sentence for tow truck for a less common situation, but we still need to, uh, to work in both directions. So ne our next Im investment was in the school. So we try to captioning uh, classes and also promoting uh, event with bilingual approach. We were the main sponsor of a um, visual vernacular contest. It is a kind of poetry using sign language. And why like, uh, a telco is a sponsor of these things? So telco industry is sponsoring like event football team. And uh, we, we like a company. We like to in invest money in promoting culture of the deaf, the deaf culture. And sign language, visual vernacular, are a great beauty that must be shared. And this is the real power of diversity. And we, as a communication system, take this mission to spread out the beauty of diversity. So this is my colleague that embraced this challenge with me. I just bring here, they can be present here, but they are always with us. And beside us three people, there are all 12 people working because nothing can be done alone. And this message is also for all of you that are in this room. Help us to spread this message and bring a new value to people and to the company. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo, for sharing that very powerful message. We have to do it together. I think the message here for the whole, the whole event, in fact. Last but not least, it is my pleasure to introduce a gentleman who works for the Zane Jordan Group. It is the leading telecommunications operator in Jordan and also in uh, Middle East and Africa, I believe. Yusuf Motawi is Chief Operating Officer, is that correct, uh, for Zane Jordan, and he's going to tell you more about how they are supporting accessibility for the deaf. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thanks, Joanna. Uh, Lorenzo, you can come to Jordan. We are a telco, and we can support such initiative. Uh, great afternoon, everybody. Uh, although the temperature outside is close to zero, but I believe such conference make Vienna warm. Thanks to ESSEL Foundation. Thanks to Mr. Essel as well. Uh, Jordan is a Middle Eastern country and the Levant area, bordered by Palestine, uh, Syria, Iraq, and Saudi. We have almost uh, 10 million inhabitants. We have mostly 20 to 25,000 deaf persons in, in Jordan. Uh, uh, the, the neighboring countries as well, they share the same standard Arabic language. We as Zain, mobile operator in Jordan, we connect people. Out of the 10 million customers in Jordan, we connect mostly four to five million out of them. And as Lorenzo said, it's not about the business case to serve deaf people. It's about 
the social responsibility of the organization to serve the, the community in, 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 in a positive way. And this is where our role really stands on. Zane Jordan decided to support those deaf people and to create for them the means to communicate, the means to interact, and the means even to, to be uh, in contact with their loved ones. Uh, jointly with the support partners in Jordan, the Higher Council for the Affairs of Persons with Disability, uh, headed by a kind, humble prince in Jordan, Prince Lyde, uh, the Public Security Department, a uh, local pharmacy chain in Jordan, and Zain, and a startup called Mind Rockets, we designed a solution for deaf people. What we did first, uh, we created a line for deaf people to communicate together using visual interaction. This line allows all deaf people to communicate visually together. So we created the mean between deaf persons to talk to each other freely without any limits. This, this line is a GSM line, normal line, called Al-Basma line. And Al-Basma does mean the smile, the smile line. The second thing we did, uh, in, order, in order to give those deaf people access to everywhere, we created for them a call center. And this call center as well allows them through this visual line to communicate with the call center, asking them for services and asking them for help as well. So all the local services in Jordan now has been piloted in Zain as a service provider, and hopefully this will be extended to serve all service providers. And this will be exactly similar to what Lorenzo has just mentioned. The third thing we did, in order, in order as well to keep the deaf people safe, we also created a hotline, visual hotline, supported with sign language specialists at the security departments. So deaf persons in Jordan right now, the ones who has the best line, can go wherever they want, and whenever they feel in danger, easily they can contact the public security department, easily. And the people in, in the public security department are trained as well to serve sign uh, deaf people with a sign language expertise. In addition to that, and what Rilovo has just mentioned about his initiative, we, we, in order to give deaf people access to health, access to pharmacies easily, as well we partnered with the biggest pharmacy chain in Jordan in order to allow visual conferencing interaction between the deaf person who walks into the pharmacy and a deaf call center who understands sign language and who can serve them with the shop prep at the pharmacy. So we extended the call center concept from Zain into a pharmacy chain, and hopefully this will be extended as well to grow into, the, into all other service centers, including malls, shopping centers, and etc. Not only that, being in Zain, during the past three years, we were highly supportive to the entrepreneurship space. And we created an innovation space in Jordan that allow people to uh, create and realize ideas. One of the ideas we, has, we have done in Jordan is to support a startup called Mind Rockets, who created uh, an app called Rams. Rams in Arabic, in English does mean symbol. And this Rams app really th does it translate the text and voice into sign language. So the deaf person or the, the friends of a deaf person or the family of, the, of a deaf person can text right on that app and translate that into a sign language that is understood by the uh, deaf person. The next step of that is to do the other way, where the deaf person, the minute he, he does the sign language, translated into text or oral communicated language. Uh, the, 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 last thing, the last thing we did, which is very much important and does, uh, does require your attention here, we need to browse internet. We need to get into the internet safely. We need to get access to knowledge. And this is really a problem where deaf people cannot really get into that. What we did, we created an avatar. This avatar is connected to the portals, 
And the minute the deaf person hovers over anything he needs to browse over the portal, this browsed content translates into a sign language. This is phase one. We, we have started that in Jordan now. Deaf persons in Jordan can get access into Zane portal and all the portals of Zane Jordan and can browse whatever we had on the portal and see it by their language. And hopefully, the coming phase to create an ABI that allow all those who has portals to have access to this avatar and give access to deaf persons to browse their content easily. So what we are looking for really is not a business objective. What we are looking for is a social responsibility. We need to give those deaf people access to society, access to knowledge, and access to a better life. Uh, I believe we are in the in, in middle of an area that, that mostly spoke the same language as we, as we did, as we do. And I believe the things that we do in Jordan can be implemented as well in Palestine, Syria, uh, Iraq, and Saudi. And thank you. I believe you wanted to show a video. Do you not want uh, to show the video? There yes, if the audio video guys can can turn on can turn on the video please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joan. Indeed, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> so, I am sure, ladies and gentlemen, that the, uh, the commitment and the passion that you've just heard from these uh, seven presentations will have inspired you to ask them some questions. So, I would ask you, if you have questions, can you raise your hand so we can see them? Do you have any questions? <clears throat> Not everyone at once. <laughs> Seriously, lunch must have been really good. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody has any questions? I'm going to start. I have a question. So, as um, a British person living for more than 20 years in Vienna, I know how many options there are for English speakers and for people who sign in British Sign Language or American Sign Language. But the options are not there for uh, people who live in Austria. So my question is uh, directed towards Lorenzo, Jonat, and Melissa. When are your applications and your products coming to Austria? Thank you for your question. Thank you for your question, Joanna. 
My answer to the question when is another question. It's when you and Martin Essel and other important Austrians come together and for us to make that possible. That's how it can happen. We always need to work with a local person or a local group, so that's how. So my answer to you is when that happens. So when will that happen? That, that sounds because like I'm a ready. challenge. <laughs> I'm ready. Everyone in the room just witness this promise. So. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> yes, and we can do it. It is possible. My, co my colleagues are sitting in the second okay. row, so we have, we have to work on a, on a cooperation very quickly, I think, with, uh, with the Qualizent. Okay, uh, I will do that. Since it's time for promises, uh, today we start the first connection uh, to open like a, a, a virtual office in Vienna and probably in Germany. So uh, if all things go well, I think in a couple of months we can launch in, uh, in Austria our service. And then I launched an, another challenge that we can, uh, for the Gala University, that we want to uh, create an exchange, uh, maybe helping us creating a story for the Italian uh, children to learning uh, sign language. And also we want to offer like, um, a scholarship for uh, Gala students to work in our company in Italy with a, a flight and uh, accommodation paid by our company. Wow, <laughs> that, that's really, that'd be awesome. I, I, I that was would trying, be so awesome. I was trying to write to Gala, that I, I sent 10 emails offering, we, we, want, we want our students, we want to pay a flight to Italy, spend time with us, but we didn't receive any answer. So when I say I am the same what? table, with the strategy and marketing are responsible, so I, I cannot miss this chance. So <laughs> yes, apologize definitely. to abusing of your time for my personal use. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, and sure. would like to, to add? I just, yeah, I just wanted to say that I am um, going to blame spam filters on that one because I think all of us have those spam filter experiences. So I, if I got one of your emails, I certainly did not ignore it. I think that this reflects the amazing synergy of this conference where people like us can come together and connect face to face. We understand the potential of networking and meeting in person. So thank you for that offer and I will certainly take you up on it. That is superb. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're being really inspired by the challenges going on on this um, panel. So uh, I, I want some more questions. Excuse me. Henry, yes, you'd like to add something. I also want, uh, it's not a, a question, it's an declaration. Uh, I want to be clear with the deaf community issue about the accessibility. Many governments and uh, social civility, civilians have now clear the uh, accessibility issue. Our issue of accessibility is about our language. It's a language accessibility. You know, in every country, it, uh, is, we have our proper sign language. And uh, more in Latin America, uh, for, to be clear, I'm uh, the uh, regional secretary for the WFD for South America. I'm in charge of the regional secretary. And uh, looking uh, for the situation of, from uh, the countries in the South America, the 70% do not have access to the edu education. The person do not have access to the education. And even though the uh, literacy in the Spanish, they do not have access to that literacy. So, and only 1% get really uh, education in sign language. Only 1%. So, uh, so many people think that the deaf person could read in Spanish, but this is a really issue about uh, accessibility because the deaf people 
in South America do not know the Spanish, uh, the writing Spanish, the literacy. In South America, the bigger problem is that do not, uh, we do not have sign language interpreters. I'm going to do a compar um, comparison. In Colombia, we do have the 700 interpreters, but in, uh, our, in our neighborhood, Ecuador, they only have 50 sign language interpreters. And in Peru, they only have 25 interpreters for the whole country. And there is a lack of uh, uh, interpreters, and it is the issue of the accessibility for the deaf people. We need to the government to understand about what is the accessibility for the deaf people. It's not for to pay interpreters. They, they said, no, the, ex the interpreter is so expensive. But uh, for example, in, at this conference, if uh, a person assists to a conference and uh, manage another language and there is no um, interpreters, how can the person communicate with the others? We are foreign people in an, our country, in a, our homeland, because we do not have interpreters. We have another language. Government thinks, uh, no, go out and uh, learn uh, Spanish, learn uh, the, our language, and this is the bigger problem for the deaf people. We need to the government to help us uh, to improve the education for the deaf people and to the access to the uh, language for the uh, deaf people. This is the barrier, the language barrier, and we need to uh, work together on solutions for that issue of accessibility for the deaf people. Deaf people can to be included in the education, but if they do not have interpreters, how can they do it? They do not nothing. They just throughout the years and receive this the diploma, but they are not really educated. Not a really education. So these diplomas are meaningless for the deaf people. They do not not they do know nothing, because the instruction is not in sign language or, or uh, through the interpreters. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing some, uh, frankly, shocking statistics on how many how many interpreters are available for people in South America. Hopefully, that can be changed, improved some, sometime soon. So um, I just want to go back to my question about Austria. I hate to change back to sure. Austria. <laughs> You're not? When are we getting Gala Pro in Austria? As soon as the theater from Austria contacts us and says, come work with us. OK, there's another challenge, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so if there are Austrians in the house, we, we want a theater to get in touch with, with uh, Gala Propter because it's time it came to Austria too. There are questions. Oh, you're wonderful people. Um, lady in white. Hi. I'm one of those Austrians who has been avoiding theaters because I just couldn't hear anything. So I'm really waiting for this app. <laughs> um, the other thing is I'm working with a boy who has deaf parents but he um, is hearing, and at, the, at school they always told the parents to read with him, which is impossible, right? So I was wondering if this story app, uh, not this storytelling um, uh, project, also is targeted towards parents who are deaf but have hearing children. And when it will be accessible in Austrian or German? <laughs> Thank you. So this question's, I guess, to Melissa. And I would also right, I ask can. you to stay oh. for the next session because you'll also hear more about Austrian applications. Okay, so just as a, I'll quickly answer your question and thank you for asking it. Yes, one of the major impacts and benefits of having storybook apps available in each country's sign language is that it addresses literacy and also parental engagement. So this means it could be deaf parents with hearing children, or more commonly, hearing parents with deaf children. They can share the experience of reading together. 
So for deaf children who have hearing children, of course, those hearing children are going to learn sign language naturally. Hearing children are going to grow up as part of the deaf community. In the community, they're referred to as children of deaf adults, otherwise known as CODAs, and they are equally as intelligent as their hearing peers with hearing parents. What Henry just said and what others on the panel have just said all really ties into the importance of early literacy and education being accessible. It impacts adults' ability later in life to use solutions that require text um, input. But if children aren't taught to read early in life, some of these other solutions that are meant to help them later aren't always practical. As Henry and I know from our firsthand engagement in the deaf community, we see just how critical these issues are to address early in life and to create positive solutions for families, families of all kinds, parents with, that are hearing with deaf children, deaf parents with hearing children, just to, in general, promote the value of sign language, then it will make education much more accessible. And this really drives home the point that Henry was just making. So thank you for your question and for your thoughts. Thank you, Melissa. I believe we have a question. A lady in the middle is wearing a white cream waistcoat. Yes, hello. My name's Kate Bennell and I'm from Sight Savers. Um, at Sight Savers last year for the first time, we undertook a basic sign language course in BSL, which was really interesting because it was my first proper experience of sign language. Um, and I think they're continuing to do the introductory course this year, hopefully later in the year. Um, but what I'm interested to know is, do you think there'll ever come a time where, sight, where sign language is taught across mainstream education schools so that everybody learns it and can therefore communicate with the deaf community in the way that French is taught at home? Melissa, would you like to answer that question? Or anybody yeah. you'd like to? Henry or I, what do you think? <laughs> oh, because I'm from Gallaudet, okay. He said that the person from Gallaudet could answer that, so I guess I'll respond. The short answer is yes. I think that that ties into one of our big discoveries related to bilingualism and the advantages of signing and early signing. So the answer again is yes. I do know of some pilot programs wherein schools that don't traditionally cater to deaf students start offering sign language, start offering instruction in sign language, but they have a balance of students. So they have the right number of students that are already signers with non-signers. And then they also have to be sure that the teachers are fluent signers to create a truly immersive environment in sign language. A setting like that is powerful because it sends the message that all kids and both languages are equal. And it's been working in some areas, in the areas where I know it's been done, but for some reason this has not become a common practice. I think that what we need is more understanding of the successes of these pilot programs and what pedagogical practices can be best implemented in a signed, spoken bilingual school. So um, again, the short answer was yes, but there is more behind that. That is certainly possible. Henry, did you want to add? Thank you. And to talk about South America, it's a very different situation. The problem in South America, and uh, another country in, in the whole world, but more in South America and Africa too, is that uh, historically sign language was uh, banned since uh, 18, 1800s. And the problem is that when a family has a deaf relative, a deaf children, they think they cannot uh, learn or they can understand nothing. So they just use the oral, the oral uh, language to do some orders to the uh, deaf children and left the children without education. And when the children has grown, has become a boy or a girl, 
is it difficult to, to him or to her to study? This is with the uh, WFD is working on it. We're working to the uh, educate to the bilingual education in sign language and the oral languages of the countries. But with the prohibition of the sign language by the 800, uh, 18, the medical uh, paradigm for the deaf people was that they do not uh, need to learn sign language. They need to re rehabilitation focus or approach. But the sign language is our language. And we are very proud of it. Uh, deaf people need the, edu the bilingual education. They need to be, uh, be teach in sign language so they can become uh, literate. We are very proud, we are very glad that uh, recently the United Nations has approved the Sign Language Day for September, the International Day for the Sign Language on September 23rd. It's the first time that the United Nations recognized the uh, a sign language uh, sign language day for international sign languages, and it, it is a great step not only for the deaf people but the hard of hearing people. They only they can uh, learn sign language. Excuse me, I got to 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 tell my story. I am the, uh, a testimony for uh, the people, for a one who lost the hearing. I, when I was a child, I lost my hearing. When I was 12, and uh, I was obligated to uh, still speak in, in Spanish. But after that, I learned sign language, and I become a person with a work, a person with a uh, identity with the deaf community. And this is... Uh, we are inviting you to learn sign language or to get involved with the deaf community. Come on. I just want to say, even though it's not my specific expertise, that uh, Access Israel has developed a program to teach hearing people uh, sign language. And it's about five or six sessions, and it can be probably transformed into any language besides um, Hebrew Sign Language, and they go to schools and they teach within the communities, and it's really meant for people to learn the basics of sign language and pass it forward to other people so they could um, um, communicate with people who do use sign language. Um, and they're all here over the they're here all over the place. So I'm sure you ask anyone from Access Israel about it, they'll be able to tell you. Thank you very much, Yonat. And I'm going to abuse horribly the privilege of being the chair of this session by saying that. I have the privilege of sending my daughter to a bilingual school here in Vienna. It is unfortunately one of only a handful and it should be, the whole, whole idea should be spread out across all of Austria if possible. My daughter is hearing, she's not deaf, uh, she is bilingual English-German, um, but she has in the last two years learned sign language and I cannot emphasize how much the benefits, the richness of her friendship group and she has dyslexia, which has more or less disappeared through sign language, I have to say. So I can only support my wonderful colleagues, all their passion and commitment, and say we need more bilingual education. I am not going to summarize this uh, session. I'm going to hand over to Petra, who's going to summarize it for you in illustrations. Thank you very much, Petra, and thank you very much to all the speakers. Yeah, you'll be able to see it on the screens. Thank you. This is not yours, it's the other side, yeah. <laughs> it's here, yeah? For you, it's here. Okay. Technik, wir sehen das auf den Monitoren nicht. Kann man das noch ändern? Yeah, I know. Yeah, but um, I yes. Yeah, 
jetzt. Super, danke. Now you should be able to see it also here. And we will zoom in, so it makes it easier. Okay, can we zoom in or not? Perfect, thank you very much. <laughs> IT solutions for deaf and hard of hearing people. Um, I think the main message, the summary is what we saw here are various projects that bring together deaf and hearing people, connecting them by a common language. Meaning that we're using the modern technology to bring languages together that have been separated until now. Um, first one, the storybook app. Uh, based on scientific research that shows that sign language and spoken language actually works in the same area of your brain. And making sure that children, deaf children, but also hearing children, get access to sign language as early as possible. So deaf experts and sign language experts were involved to develop a storybook app. And this should train and empower teachers and families and everybody involved in the, in the support of deaf children. And one thing was that, one message was that we should start with asking the question, what is possible, rather than what is not possible. Another one, bringing um, cinema accessible to everyone. Um, Cine para todos, I hope I said it correctly, Cine para todos. Um, works in 12 cities in Colombia. It's based on a national policy and already 80,000 plus people have been reached with this application. Um, it is an app that does also audio description, so it also helps blind people, but it also gives sign language interpretation and high contrast subtitles so that deaf people have the p possibility to understand films better. The goal is to distribute the app to everyone. At the moment, they're playing in 12 cities, but the goal is to bring that out to the world to make it sustainable. Uh, Centro de Relevo um, is a very good example of public and private partnership, where um, online and very quick, uh, deaf people can find sign language interpreters. And right now in the discussion, we heard it again, there is such a lack of sign language interpreters, especially it's not only about Colombian sign language and also Spanish sign language, and also a very low number who also speak English and have English sign language. So there is a low, low number, and in order to help this problem, this application has been developed. And one of the factors is that also families now get better support to communicating with each other, with, if they have deaf family members. But that's just one of the possibilities with this application. Gala Pro, an application that should be a solution for every kind of action you can take in terms of going to the cinema, to the theater, going to the opera, or maybe even a touristic site. Um, at the moment, what it does, it's on your mobile phone. And it's an app that you can customize yourself. And you can use it in any chair you like. So you don't have to sit in a specific place. And it supports you with um, voice recognition. And it's, it gives you captioning, some kind of translation, and dubbing. So you get the information, you get the full experience that you're hearing friends also get, and you can go to the, the theater, the cinema, or wherever you like, all together. And it's important to get the message out to theaters and so on, so that they start understanding, they can increase their number of guests by opening up for everyone. Another one, um, a service provided, I would say to the citizens of the United States, but it's actually more than that. Yeah? It's diplomatic, so it's a worldwide thing, um, to bring all the services provided by the Office of Accessibility and other offices, but it's your job to do it, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, with its 100,000 employees, um, on a 
on a SharePoint where you can get all kinds of information um, with video captioning. And just one thing I, uh, I got out was, first of all, you want to have messages without barriers. Within 24 hours, which is great, things can be transformed into video captioning and then people are serviced um, to get the information they need. And it's also information for the employees who were also involved in the whole process. A lot of key factors for success, but we'll, you can ask you later on <laughs> on that. Um, yeah, and then um, one thing that we all encounter, and I know from my deaf and hard of hearing friends, is many, many times you have to make a phone call if you need something. Yeah, you need, I don't know, emergency uh, support, or you want to call in a company and want to get some information. And it's all done with call centers. Now, for the hearing ones, call centers are a bit of a pain, but if you're not hearing, you don't even have the possibility to use a call center or any kind of phone line. So, um, Pedius is offering a social entrepreneur business approach to bring uh, information for deaf people um, in a very easy way. So, it is information transformed um, from text to speech or from speech to text. And I think on a mobile phone or application, yeah, you get the messages you need. And there was a very powerful message saying, um, let's use the power and beauty of diversity and use it as a business case and make it for everyone so that the society also gets this message. It's, but it's a business approach. Yeah? So that is probably also very interesting. Last but not least, Zane in Jordan. Yeah? We heard that there are about 20,000 to 25,000 deaf people in Jordan who also need access to several information and services. So what Zane does, and I'm not sure if I captured all of them because it's so much you're doing. Yeah? Um, you're offering a service so that, first of all, deaf people can communicate with each other quicker. Um, it also helps that deaf people are included in their social community and society. There is a safety hotline where you get um, a relay interpreter so that with the safety uh, companies like police and so on, you get the information you need and you get it across quickly. You also have a cooperation with the pharmacy chain where a sign language interpretation is offered. And, I'm sorry, it didn't turn out very nice, but this is supposed to be the 3D avatar <laughs> providing sign language information to everyone at the time they need it and the um, quality they need it in. And also, it is an important part of education for deaf and hard of hearing people. And it's also based on social responsibility. And once again, all these uh, projects show that it is possible to bring together two worlds that have been separated and that could be connected by sign language now, but now there are even more possibilities. So let's hope this works all over the world. Petra, thank you so much for that absolutely superb visual summary. Absolutely out of this world. Brilliant. So, I'd like to uh, close the session. I'd like to say a huge thank you to the Zero Project for making all of this possible. Without them, we wouldn't be meeting like this, and I value it every year more and more. I would, above all, like to thank the people sitting on the podium next to me, who it's been an honor to introduce. Their inspirational ideas, I hope, will motivate you, and please do get in touch with them. There are plenty more opportunities for all of us if we share, if we network. And that's the whole point of being here. So thank you very much. I'm going to make sure I don't miss anybody. Jonat, Lorenzo, Stephen. Who else have I got? Yusuf, Yaifa, Henry, and Melissa. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.